In this video, I'm planning on showing you how to solve this problem, which is a diffuser problem. So basically we have an open system. So we have mass flow in and out of our um, diffuser. And this diffuser is in a jet engine. And it says it's designed to decrease the kinetic energy of the air entering the engine compressor without any worker heat interactions. So let's just start writing down what we have. First of all, we have a diffuser, so I'm just going to draw a basic sketch of a diffuser. And then we have mass flow in, mass flow out. And it tells us that it's that the velocity, or it wants us to calculate the velocity at the exit. So I'm just going to put V2 is equal to question mark. Um, so calculate the velocity at the exit when air at 100 kilopascal and 30 degrees Celsius enters with a velocity of 350. So we have um, at the entrance, we have that P1 is equal to 100 kilopascals and T1 is equal to 30 degrees Celsius. And the, the velocity, so V1, is equal to 350 meters per second. And then it tells us the exit state is, and then it gives us um, P2 and T2. So we have that P2 is equal to 200 kilopascals and T2 is equal to 90 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's, um, and it also tells us that there's no heat or work interactions. So right away, it's telling us that the um, work is equal to zero, and it's also telling us that Q is equal to zero. So let's um, let's make some assumptions. So first of all, we can assume that this is steady flow because we're assuming that we're past the startup phase, um, and it's not in the shutdown phase. So. In other words, the mass inside the diffuser isn't going to be changing with time. Basically, if we have mass flow in and it's the diffuser isn't, um, like we're not losing pressure, um, we're not, so we're not losing mass inside the diffuser, we're not, um, we're not increasing the mass with time because that would lead to an unstable system. So basically, one of the assumptions we need to make is that this is steady flow. And it doesn't specifically tell us that, but we can just figure that out based on the, the mass. If the diffuser is operating correctly, the mass can't be um, increasing or decreasing inside the diffuser if it's not during the startup or shutdown. So we're assuming that this is steady flow. So what that means is that m dot 1 is equal to m dot 2, which is equal to m dot. And then the other thing we want to consider is whether or not we have an ideal gas. And so we have air that, so it's just air that's entering and exiting this diffuser. And we have the temperatures and pressures, so we should be able to figure out if this is ideal. Um, first of all, just by looking at it, we should be able to figure out that it's probably ideal because our pressures are pretty low. The um, temperature is pretty high, but let's, well, not high, high, but it's, um, it's high compared to the, the critical point of air. So let's just write down what the um, critical temperature and pressure are just so that we can um, verify that this is ideal. So if we look at um, table a dash one for air, we find that the critical temperature is equal to 132.5 Kelvin, which is equal to negative 140.5 degrees Celsius. And the critical pressure is equal to 3.77 megapascal. So our pressure is really low compared to the critical pressure and our temperature is pretty high compared to the critical temperature. So we're going to assume that this is an ideal gas. 
All right, so we have all of our problem information. We have our assumptions. Now let's write down the equations we're going to use. So it's asking for the velocity, the output velocity of the diffuser. And so we're going to need to do an energy balance to solve this problem. So let's just write down our um, first law. And I'm going to write down the equation for the single stream steady flow, because that's what we have. We've determined that it's steady flow, and it's single stream. We only have one stream in and one stream out. So the equation Q minus W is equal to M dot, and then we have H2 minus H1 plus B2 squared. And I'm going to actually, so we had assumed that for this equation that was derived previously, we had assumed that the potential energy was zero, but I'm just going to write this term in, and then we're going to add to our assumption list that the change in potential energy is equal to zero. And the reason why is because there's not a large elevation change over this um, diffuser. And so this term is zero. So, and we also know that it tells us in the problem that we have air entering a diffuser to decrease the kinetic energy of the air entering the engine compressor without any work or heat interactions. So that means that these terms are both zero as well. So we're left with um, this equation. So zero is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by H2 minus H1 plus V two squared minus V one squared over two. And that's just gonna go. So basically we know the velocity at the entrances because that was given. It's asking us to calculate the velocity at the output. So if we go back to this equation, basically what we need is the change in enthalpy. So we need this term. So we can do this a couple of different ways. So we want to find delta H. We can do this by one constant specific heats, or constant specific heat at the average temperature. And then we can just look it up. So if we if we assume that, then the change in enthalpy is equal to um, C sub P average T2 minus T1. The other way that we can do this is we do have a table with data available for air. So we could also look up H2 and H1 on the air table. And we know the temperature at the inlet and outlet, so we, so we have everything we need to, to look those up. Um, either one of these will work to solve this. I think it's easiest to solve it the first way, but they're probably both equivalent. Um, so I'm gonna solve this the first way and then, and show you how to do that. And then I'm gonna solve it the second way with the air table, so you can just see how you would do it um, both ways. So we're looking for um, delta H, and so we have delta H, and so we're we're doing we're going to assume the constant specific heat first and solve this. So we have delta H is equal to C sub P average T2 minus T1. So we need to look up. Um, C sub P at the average temperature. The average temperature is 303 plus 363 divided by 2, which is equal to 333. So this is T average. And then if we look this up on table A 2, we get that C sub P at 3. 33 Kelvin is equal to 1.007 kilojoules 
kilogram Kelvin. And we know the temperatures, so I'm going to actually go back to this equation and I'm just going to solve it for the, um, for the exit velocity. And so if I write down that equation, I have zero is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by um, H2 minus H1 plus V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2. And then, oh, and then this one away. And then we're replacing this delta H with C sub P average T2 minus T1. And so then let's just rearrange this equation. What I want to do is solve this equation for um, V2 since that's what we're interested in. So we can rearrange this equation. I'm going to move CP average over to the other side. And so this is going to be, t I'm, so I just um, swap the signs because when I move um, this over to the other side, I end up with a negative. And so if I just multiply that negative sign through, I swap the signs on the temperature. So now I have T1 minus T2 is equal to V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2. So now let's um, now let's multiply the 2 over and then we can add plus V1 squared and then we're going to just take the square root of the whole thing. So we have V2 is equal to 2 C sub P, and this is C sub P average. T1 minus T2 plus V1 squared, and then we're, and then just to the um, half power is the same thing as the square root. Um, so now we have our equation for our exit velocity. And so what we're going to do is just plug in our information. We have everything for this. So we know C sub P average because we looked it up at the average temperature. Um, we know T1 and T2 because they were given. We know V1 squared because it was given. So let's just go ahead and start plugging in some values. So V2 is equal to 2. And then C sub P average was 1.007 kilojoules kilogram Kelvin. And then this is multiplied by 30 minus 90. And these temperatures are in Celsius, but the thing is um, the delta for degrees Celsius is equivalent to delta K. So in other words, um, if, in other words, it doesn't matter if I have these in Kelvin or Celsius since I'm just taking the difference. I'm going to end up with the same thing. So I can just do that and I'm going to end up with the same uh, change in temperature. And then this is plus and then V1, the velocity in, is 350 meters per second and then this is squared and then this is all to the one half. All right, so the Kelvins cancel. And then it looks like we have some screwy units because we have kilojoules per kilogram and meters squared second squared. Well, so what we need to do with these units is one, we, we need to use a, a conversion factor. So one kilojoule per kilogram is equal to 1,000 meters squared second squared. So what we can do is V2 is equal to, and I'm just going to go through and, and do this math. So 2 multiplied by 1.007 multiplied by delta temperature is negative 120.84. And then the units are kilojoules per kilogram. But then we need to multiply this by this conversion factor to get to get the meter squared second squared. So this is going to be multiplied by 1,000 meters squared second squared 
over one kilojoule per kilogram plus, and then we have 350 squared meters squared seconds squared to the one half. So now our unit should work out because now we have both of our terms have meters squared seconds squared. So if we just plug this into our calculator, we get that the outlet velocity is 40.7 meters per second. All right, so now let's, um, so this is how we would solve this using the constant specific heats. Now let's just look at how we would solve this using the air table. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to our general equation, so this one. So this, and I'm going to rewrite it down here. So we have 0 is equal to H2 minus H1 plus V2 squared minus V1, well, change in kinetic energy. And <clears throat> now what we're going to do is instead of assuming a constant specific heat to calculate delta H, we're just going, we're going to look up the enthalpy at state 1 and state 2 on the air table. So we're going to look up H2 and H1 on the air table. And this is table A-17. So for state 2, the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, and we need this in Kelvin for the air table, so this is 303 Kelvin, and H1, so the enthalpy, at, actually this is H2, um, this is state 1, yeah, this is state 1, so we're looking up the, the enthalpy for at state 1, or at the entrance, so um, H1 is equal to 303 0.19 kilojoules per kilogram. And then at state 2, T2 is equal to 90 degrees Celsius, but we need this in Kelvin, so this is 363 Kelvin. So H2 is equal to 363.58 kilojoules per kilogram. And so then what we can do is just plug these directly into this equation and solve, and, and we know V1, so then we can solve for the outlet velocity. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to actually rearrange that equation, so I, I'm going to solve for, I'm going to do the same thing I did before, so I'm going to just solve this equation for the outlet velocity, and then I'm going to plug everything in. So I have H1 minus H2, and all I did was um, subtract this term over, but then the sign swapped because I because it's subtracted. So H1 minus H2 is equal to V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2, and so then I can multiply the 2 over and add the entrance velocity. So then I get, and also take the square root of all of that, so I'm going to get that V2 is equal to 2 multiplied by H1 minus H2 plus V1 squared, and this is to the 1 half. So I know everything. I know H1 and H2 because I looked them up, and I know the entrance velocity because it was given. So all I need to do is plug numbers into this equation and solve it. So V2 is equal to, and this is 2, and then H1 was 303.19 kilojoules per kilogram, minus, and then H2 was 363.58 kilojoules per kilogram. And then we need our the same conversion factor that we used before to get kilojoules per kilogram into meters squared, seconds squared. So I'm just going to put that in now. So 1,000 meters squared, seconds squared, over 1 kilojoule per kilogram. 
and then this is plus 350 squared, don't forget the squared, and then meter squared, second squared, to the one half. So this kilojoules per kilogram is going to cancel, and we're going to be left with meter squared, second squared, which are the correct units. So then if we plug all of this into our calculator, we get that V2 is equal to 41.5 meters per second. So this is pretty close to what we got before assuming the constant specific heats. So once again, you can solve this problem either way. So basically, if I go back up here to the energy balance, all we're doing is writing our first law, energy balance, um, figuring out which terms cancel or which terms are zero, and then and then sol and then figuring out what we need to like. So once we once we figured out which terms were zero, the only thing that we needed to find was this delta H, and so then you can either find that using constant specific heats, or you can look up H2 and H1 on the air table and solve it that way. So either way works fine for this problem. Um, the, the only time, so if you have a gas that you don't have an air, that you don't have a table for, so like let's say you have argon or krypton or xenon or something like that, um, then you would have to assume the constant specific heat because you don't have data to to look up the enthalpies on a table. So you would have to assume constant specific heat and then calculate the change in enthalpy. And the other thing is, remember how the, the table for, um, like we have, we only have a limited, at least in this book, and I'm using thermodynamics and engineering approach, CBK, um, the Table A-2, if we want to look up the specific heats at, at average temperatures, we only have data for air, CO2, CO, H2, N2, and O2. So if we have a gas other than those, we might even have to take this a step further and assume that it's a constant specific heat at room temperature. So we have, we have a lot more um, specific heat data available for various gases at room temperature. So just approach these problems in a very ordered way and um, set them up the same way each time. So basically, how I did this was first I wrote down all of the data from the problem, so all of this. And I always do that, even if the, pro even if the setup seems really obvious, I still do that. Um, then I write down any assumptions, and you're going to try and get all of your assumptions at the beginning, but if if you miss some of them, you might just go back and add to the list as you're solving the problem. And then we write down the equations that we need to solve. So in this case, we need to we're, we need to solve the first law. So we need to do an energy balance to calculate this outlet velocity. So we apply the first law equation to figure out which terms are zero, and then um, figure out what we need to solve from there. So in this case, the only thing we needed was the change in enthalpy. So in this case, we could u either use a constant specific heat to get the change in enthalpy, or we could look it up on the air table.